But here's a question. Where do you store your hope? And hopefully it's not in the wardrobe. Hopefully it's not in your study or in the spare room. Where do you put your hope? You see, we've been defining grace uh, this term. And uh, although the message titles may not have been this, but we have learnt that grace is firstly a present and grace is also a person. But I want to say to you today that grace is a place. Grace is a place where hope is meant to be stored. And maybe like our kitchen appliances, you've tried to store hope in a variety of locations, only to find that it needed to be moved because of some foreseen or even unforeseen circumstances. When you place your hope in grace, however, it never needs to be moved. And I can't wait for our kitchen appliances to be in the place where they're meant to be, so I never need to move them again. But when you place your hope in the grace of God and keep it there, you will never need to move it again. The Bible says that hope does not disappoint us. When Paul wrote that, he was taking for granted that hope had been put in the right place. Because if it hasn't, it certainly has the potential to disappoint. I've been disappointed by hope. It happened in 2009. My superannuation statement arrived in the mail. Did that year? Does every year. But in the 12 months preceding 2009... Guess what had just happened? The GFC, the global financial crisis. Hope disappointed me when I saw that almost a third of the value of my super had been wiped off the bottom line due to this economic downturn. I had hoped that that particular mix of investments that I'd chosen would have fared a little bit better. And it seemed to me that if the Bible said that hope does not disappoint us, then the hope I had for my super must have either been a different type of hope than what the Bible talked about, or I'd put my hope in a different place than what the Bible had thought I would put it into. I think largely that when it comes to hope, the greater proportion of people in our community, your neighbours and friends, and maybe even some of you here this morning, would rather irrigate your garden by foot than irrigate it by gravity. When it comes to hope, many are irrigate by foot people when God's best for us is to to be irrigate by gravity people. And before you think that I've completely lost my marbles, we're about to go to a scripture which hopefully will explain all of that for us. So let's pray and then we'll open his word, Deuteronomy chapter 11. Father God, I want to thank you this morning that uh, already through the giving message, you've brought confirmation of what uh, we're talking about this morning. Father, I thank you that you're a God that looks over us, that watches over us, not just sometimes, but every moment of every day you watch over us. Father, I pray that as we read your word, it will become clear to us where we can place our hope. And Father, I pray that through your grace this morning, we would receive that which we need to know, personally, individually. Lord God, for many of us are in very different places with regard to hope, whether we can trust it or some of us have decided not to trust it. But Lord God, today I pray that you would minister to us by your word, in Jesus' name, amen. So reading from Deuteronomy chapter 11 and reading from verses 2 through 12. Observe, therefore, all the commands I'm giving you today so that you may have the strength to go in and take over the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess and so that you may live long in the land the Lord swore to your ancestors to give them and their descendants, a land flowing with milk and honey. The land you are entering to take over is not like the land of Egypt from which you have come, where you planted your seed and irrigated it by foot as in a vegetable garden. But the land you are crossing the Jordan to take possession of is a land of mountains and valleys that drinks rain from heaven. It's a land the Lord your God cares for. The eyes of the Lord your God are continually on it from the beginning of the year to its end. 
Now, the background to this passage, the nation of Israel are on the verge of crossing the Jordan to take possession of this promise of God, a land to call their own. Moses is about to die and he's giving this final address to the people before he climbs the mountain. Joshua is on the verge of stepping up into the leadership of this incredibly large nation. And this is a crucial and transitional time for the nation. Perhaps the final remarks of Moses on this occasion would be the most important advice he'd ever given to the people of God. And here in this final speech of Moses to God's people, he drew a comparison between the land that they had come from and the land that they were about to enter. And strangely, of all things that he could have given on this important occasion, he gives them a heads up as to the agricultural potential of the land as compared to the land that they come from. And specifically how the crops would be watered. It sounds a bit like micromanagement, doesn't it? But there's more going on here than just some helpful tips to the farmers of Israel. Moses is pointing out two places where hope can be placed and contrasting them for the people. He was about to go the way of all men. That's how the Bible terms it. But he wanted to leave them with a clear picture for this largely agrarian culture of how to have their hope for the future firmly anchored in something that would never, ever change. See, this is more than just a a gardening guru lesson uh, for those who are interested. It was more than that. It was a lesson in putting your hope in the place of grace, not the place of effort. My faith formative years were in a church only about 20 minutes from here in Anala. And as a youngster, I was part of the boys' club or boys' group of that church. It was very, very similar to scouts. And every year, we'd go camping once or twice. And on each of those camps, there would always be a hike programmed in. I I remember one particular 20-kilometre hike that was like this. It was just emblazoned on my memory. I think I cried during that hike. Yeah. But these hikes were not on prepared tracks. Rather, we would find our own way to our destination with the use of a compass and a map. Now, for some of you, maybe a compass and a map is not too familiar to you. Let me just say it was the predecessor to GPS, uh, using those two things together. The idea was that we could find our camp location on the map and then decide on a circuit hike of so many kilometres that would eventually bring us back to our camp again by by following only the map and using only the compass to find our way. And as we set out on the bearing on which we would travel, we would locate a point in the distance, maybe a tree, maybe a rocky outcrop, some distance away, but it was on the line of our bearing. We had the compass bearing that we needed to follow, and we, so we found something that was in that line. We set our focus upon it, and that's what we walked to. That's what we hiked to. We always knew that if we continued to have our bearing before us and the point on that bearing that we were walking to, that eventually it would return us to the campsite from which we left. And at times we would face obstacles like cliffs. Sometimes we'd face the obstacle of a creek and we'd need to to go around it. But one particular difficulty stands out to me. Sometimes we would find ourselves in a large paddock with no visible geographical feature on which to fix fix our bearing. What to do? Where to go? What do you do when there's nowhere to fix your bearing? What do you do when there's no obvious thing that you can hike to and eventually get you back to home? What do you do? And I remember as a boy being tempted to take a bearing on a cloud. (laughs) I remember as a boy being tempted to take a bearing on a cow. In my early hearing I didn't understand that bearings need to be taken on points that will not move and can be trusted. (laughs) To take a bearing on a cow for example was asking for trouble. You see cows can stay in the one spot for a long time but they will eventually move and particularly as you get closer to them. You would then find yourself without a fixed bearing and quickly lose your position on the map. Hope the Bible says, is eternal alongside faith and love. But hope differs from faith and love in that its focus is exclusively on the future. You see, faith and love can have a focus on the future, 
but they can also have a, a focus on the present, but not hope. Exclusively, it has its eye on where it's going. Hope, the Bible says, does not disappoint us. Hope is like a true bearing that will always bring you to the right destination. That is, of course, if we place our hope in what can be trusted and will not change like cows and clouds. See, the cows and clouds of life will always move. You can't place your hope in those things. Hope is the bearing, but grace is the place at which you are focused while you remain on that bearing. My superannuation did the same thing year after year. It continued to show me a steady rise in the value of my investment. The statement would arrive in the mail and I would get a smile on my face. But then in a matter of months, in a matter of months, all of what it had increased over those years was wiped off its value. It moved. And had my hope been placed in it regarding my retirement, that hope at that point would have been dashed. Thankfully, Deb and I decided that, the Lord willing, we won't retire. (laughs) The Lord willing, we won't retire, but continue doing what God's called us to do until he calls us home. Now, the face of that might change. You can't continue at the same pace, obviously, as you get older, but we do want to minister in some capacity, whatever that looks like. Retirement's just not on our... If you say, what are you going to do in your retirement? We wouldn't know. Things like super become less important, I've found, when you've placed your hope in a different location. When you've placed your hope and where... uh, Sorry, where you've placed your hope and where do you continue to place it each day? That's a question we need to ask ourselves. Not just where we place it long term, but where am I placing it today? Because sometimes you can't see long term. I'll talk about that a little bit in a moment. Sometimes the place for your hope is as visible as a mountain rising out of a plain on a clear day. But at other times, it's as elusive as a bare, flat, featureless paddock. Where are you placing your hope? And when I say hope, I mean the hope that God means, the hope that we read about in the Bible, not the hope that you read about in your dictionary. Because this is what my dictionary says about the meaning of the word hope. It says, a feeling of expectation and desire, Uh, a feeling. It also says, intend, if possible, to do something. See, that's the world's idea of hope. It's It's a feeling, it's a hoping, it's, oh, it may happen. A feeling, if possible. That's the best meaning my dictionary, and many people can give to the word hope. In an almost resigned way for the opposite to be their case, they say, I hope so. That's not the Bible's meaning for hope. In the New Testament, the Greek word for the word hope is the word elpis. Not Elvis. Elvis is the king of rock and roll. (laughs) Elpis. Elpis is a confident and eager expectation of good. A confident, not a feeling, a confident and eager expectation, not something that may happen. Of good. That's the, that's the Old Testament. In the new, in the old, in, that's the New Testament, rather. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word is yahal, and yahal means a confident expectation. See, when God talks about hope, he's not talking about some ethereal, vague, might be, could be somewhere someday. He's talking about something that you can stake your life on. Hope is a strong word, a certain word. It's not a lucky word. It's not a wishful word. It's a certain word. uh, Hebrews 6.19 says, We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. 2 Corinthians 1.7 says, And our hope for you is firm. Even when we're talking about other people, we can have a hope for them which is confident. Remember that when you're speaking into the life of another person. Their hope may be all over the place, but you can have a hope for them which is anchored in God. 1 Thessalonians 1.3 says, your endurance inspired by hope. Let me tell you, the only way you're going to persevere in following the Lord Jesus Christ is to have that hope that you can plant in his grace. Let's not have our hope watered down so that we're more akin to a maybe, sometimes, if my boat comes in type of hope. 
Let's fix our hope on something immovable and sure and certain and will come to pass. You know why the biblical hope is so certain and so strong? It's because it draws its strength and draws its confidence and draws its certainty from where it is placed. Where you've placed your hope. Where have you placed it? And here was Moses giving his last advice to the people he had led for the past 40 years. And in effect, it's advice on where to place their confident and eager expectation of good, where to place their hope. It was in the place where God is always looking. It's on the place where God's provision comes without human effort. We just heard from Olivia, all that effort resulted in the land of lack. But trusting in God and placing his kingdom first resulted in the land of more than enough. Egypt wasn't always the place of slavery. See, sometimes it's not that clear where we've placed our hope. Like Egypt. It wasn't that clear at first. Egypt was the place of salvation for early Israel. When it was just Jacob and his sons and the people, 70 in all, Egypt was a place of life. The known world was in famine and had it not been for Joseph and his godly management of Egypt, Israel would most likely have perished in a fruitless, barren, promised land. Egypt was a place where a, where a family became a nation, where 70 people turned into millions. But Egypt was never meant to be the permanent place for their hope. And maybe you've placed your hope somewhere and it's bringing good return. And maybe you're going through a time at the moment when that return is not so good, when things have changed. Perhaps you've been in an Egypt with your hope all this time. Perhaps you're still in an Egypt. Maybe things are still looking good. But can I tell you, if you've placed your hope in anything apart from the grace of God, it's in the wrong place, no matter how good it looks. For Egypt was never meant to be the permanent place for their hope because it was a representation of man's effort and eventually became a place of slavery. Moses gave an interesting description of Egypt, though. He could have called it the land of slavery, but instead he called it the land which had to be irrigated by foot. And Egypt's still a dry land, and still today it, it, it relies on the flood season of the Nile River to fill its dams and reservoirs so that the people can have um, water to irrigate their farms. But in Moses' day, the irrigation ditches needed to be kept clear by hand to keep the water flowing to the crops. And it was filthy work, often knee-deep in mud, in constant danger of disease, and the work never came to an end. It was hard work, walking the ditches, clearing the obstacles, then digging new ditches to still dry areas. It was irrigation by foot. And as we know, that work eventually became slavery under cruel taskmasters. And Moses used this description of the land of Egypt to contrast the promised land that, he, that Israel was about to enter. Canaan was a land of mountains and valleys where water from the rain of heaven found its own way down to bring life to the fields. This was a land dependent on what God did, not on what man did. And more than that, Moses described the attention that God gave to the land. It was an all-day, everyday attention. God never stopped caring for this promised land. From the beginning of the year to its end, God's eyes were on this land. Egypt was the land of human effort. Canaan was the land of God's free-flowing grace. And these two countries are also representations of where to place your hope. Egypt represents your own effort and your own ingenuity, your skill and what you're able to achieve, your success, your position, your influence, your wealth. And perhaps like Egypt, it has served you well in the past. But it was never meant to be your place of hope. As humans, we're capable of amazing feats. And I've, I've met some people who have banked on themselves and won. I marvel at the wisdom of some people and just their ability to, to size up a situation and, and make the right decision. Just like Egypt, their own ability and effort may have been their salvation. But God's attention is not attracted by your effort. His attention is glued to those who are not trusting in God but themselves. You know, just that in itself is incredibly good news. God is not attracted by your effort. The more that you do does not make an iota of difference to God. But here's why it's good news. 
Because when you fail, and you will in your own effort, and you begin to trust in God, rather than rebuke you, punish you, condemn you, his eyes are drawn to you to give you more grace. God had a much greater salvation in mind for the nation of Israel and for you and I if we would place our hope in him rather than on our own effort. The land of Canaan represented all that God could do. It represented a place where his grace flowed freely, even to the most undeserving, direct from heaven to earth. No intermediary. Direct from heaven to earth. It wasn't the flat land of human drudgery where what I do determines the outcome of my life. It's not the place of the irrigate by foot people whose only hope is in themselves, but is the land of steadfast mountains and valleys, the things that never change. It's the land of God's provision, protection and attention. It's the kingdom of God's son, Jesus Christ. He is God's complete provision. He is God's eternal salvation. He is the grace of God. And Jesus is the only firm place in in whom to anchor your hope. If hope's an anchor, where have you dropped it? Have you settled for the place of your effort? Or will you drop anchor into God's firm and secure place of grace? Will you put your hope in the completed work of Jesus Christ? He's your hope. Because in his life and death, and resurrection, he did everything that God required of you, but you were incapable of doing. I'm not sure that I know all of you here this morning and whether you've made that decision to put your hope in the Lord Jesus Christ and there is a first time for everything. And so I'm talking to you this morning, if you're here and you don't have a relationship with God, you've never put your trust in Jesus Christ, then I'm offering you today an opportunity to do that but as much as I'm talking to you I'm talking to everybody else because putting your trust in Jesus sometimes is a daily decision when you face the things of life that come against you in our world you are tempted to place that hope in a lot of different places but God wants your hope in one place and sometimes the things of life will remind us daily of that place your hope in him I want to pray for you this morning if you've lost your way. Perhaps you're in that place with nowhere to fix your bearings. Life seems like a bare, featureless place and nothing appears on the horizon to get a fix on and move forward to in the right direction. (coughs) Don't jump to the conclusion that you'll just have to trust in cows or clouds. When you find yourself in the open paddock with nothing to place your bearings on, patience is key and so is observation. Stay where you are, because up until that point, you've been going in the right direction. That's what I learned. Stay where you are and take your bearing on something that you can see, even if it's only a metre in front of you. We would take a bearing on a piece of manure if it would help, because we knew it wouldn't move. (laughs) Stay where you are, rather than looking to the horizon for your points of reference, look closer to where you are. God will never leave you when you put your trust in him. Several years ago, our family hired one of those barbecue boats at Bribey, or just across from Bribey on Pummerstone Passage. And before setting off, we were given specific instructions on how to sail the boat, what beacons to stay left of, what beacons to stay left of, right of, what hazards were lying just under the water, how to avoid them, how to negotiate the extensive boat traffic on that particular waterway. And I'm used to sailing boats in open water, but the level of concentration for this particular barbecue boat was far in excess of what you need for a sailboat, I found. It was more than I expected. Although you didn't have to be as vigilant as driving a car, perhaps, there were still enough hazards to keep my mind on the task at hand without too many distractions. When we finally reached our destination to have a barbecue lunch, we found a quiet cove and dropped anchor. Once the anchor was down, the motor off... The boat held firmly in position. I could let go of control and relax. Throw a couple of steaks on the barbie, a few lines in the water. And that's a picture of hope when we place it in the one who will not move. When we place it in the grace of God that we have 
in Jesus Christ. It's take off the hands of control. Isn't that a wonderful place to be? We've got a lot of control freaks in our church, I've noticed. I won't ask you to put up your hands. A lot of control freaks. Maybe in those areas where we feel we need to have hands on, like our children, like our finances, like our relationships, like your work, like the things you can't control. And yet they're exactly the places where you want to control. Maybe in those places, we just need to remember the grace of God in Jesus Christ and commit our children, our finances, our relationships, our job into his hands. And maybe we'll find that we can throw a couple of stakes on the barbie. <laughs> not dismiss it. I'm not saying that. And I'm not saying that we can just, oh, yeah, God will look after it. He will. But put your, trust, put your effort in putting your trust in him. That's what I'm saying. That's the hope God wants us to have. Trusting in what he has accomplished in Jesus Christ with a firm and secure future. We can let go of the control we felt we needed and let God's grace freely flow into our lives. Maybe life for you has taken a turn for the worse. The place, that place or person or job or whatever it was that you'd placed your hope in just up and moved. And suddenly you've been left without your bearings for life. You were tracking so well in life, going like a train and doing well and then slowly, even overnight maybe, it all changed. Olivia read from the end of Matthew 6 and I was going to but I don't need to now because she's already read that passage. But let me, let me summarise it for you. Jesus is preaching to the crowds. It's part of the Sermon on the Mount. Most of us have heard about that. And he starts talking to them about their worry, what they'll eat, what they'll wear, what they'll drink. And Jesus reminds them that if their heavenly father looks after things like birds and flowers, they don't need to labour so hard after, after those things that they need. He tells them that they should fix their attention on today, not the worries of tomorrow. Take your bearings. It's like he's saying, take your bearings from somewhere a bit closer. When those things, those important issues of life are starting to crowd you and make you anxious and begin to worry you, then take your bearings on where the grace of God is for you today. Where's the grace of God for me today? And begin to thank God for that because you will identify. He's never left you. He's never forsaken you. He's always with you. And so there will be identifiers of his grace in your life.